we can see an ulcer in the middle of the eye, but we're actually worried there are other ulcers underneath the third eyelid. Come around this side, have a look under that third eyelid flap. I think there's something there. Look at that. What is that? Oh. My. A familiar sight around Sydney is the mobile vet clinic run by identical twin vets Audrey and Alison. I don't know what it's like to not be a twin, but it's definitely the best thing ever. Advantageous. Yeah. We work together, we have the same likes, we know what the other one's feeling. <laughs> yeah, and we're the other half of each other. Paco. Today, the girls are about to check a feisty cat that's been in the wars. Last night we got an email from Paco's owner and it was a picture of Paco with lots of blood coming out his eye. So we were pretty shocked, keen to see him today and check it out. Oh, that eye looks sore. Come on in. <laughs> owner Andrew is anxious about his special mate. Paco is my uh, great companion. He's a very sweet cat that uh, has really made my life very rich. So do you know how it happened? Yeah, I was uh, moving house and there was a new cat that was in the area who was like twice his size and I thought, ooh, that's not going to be good if they actually meet up. Mm. But anyways, when I came back to pick him up, his eye and his ego were both very, very hurt. <laughs> Poor Paco. So Paco's one of our regular patients uh, and he's a loved patient, but he has got a quirky personality. He hates both. Unfortunately, that means he hates both of us too. He's scared. <laughs> That's not a good sign. With a potentially painful eye injury, Paco is even grumpier than usual. So I think probably the blood's come from him rubbing or scratching, but I'm very worried about the actual eye itself. The worst thing that could happen is that there's a massive ulcer or a big deep scratch under that third eyelid, which would make us a bit concerned because the eye could rupture. I just hope there's nothing that they find actually more serious where he might have to lose the eye. But uh, yeah, we'll just have to see. OK, so this is fluorescein dye. So we're basically just going to pop that inside the eye. The dye will show up any ulcers or scratches. So let's see how we're going to get this in the eye. Alison will have to aim from outside the box. Paco is far too agitated to try to get any closer. Oh. <laughs> I got it. Did you get it? Oh, how goodness. did you get it in wow. the eye? She got it in the eye. <laughs> That's pretty good for you because you really have bad aim. I have really bad ball skills, but obviously fluorescein skills. <laughs> <laughs> and we can just see there, even with that third eyelid halfway across the eye, that there's actually a pinpoint mm. also right in the middle. But what I'm concerned about is whether there's actually more injuries in the eye besides that little pinpoint ulcer. So I think we're probably going to have to bring him to hospital and give him a sedation or general anaesthetic just so we can really open up the eye, pull okay. the third eyelid back. Obviously, if he's scratched his cornea, that's more serious. Mm -hmm. Poor Paco. Here we go, Paco. Here is Paco. Audrey and Alison have arrived at the hospital with Paco. We can see an ulcer in the middle of the eye, but we're actually worried there are other ulcers underneath the third eyelid. So often with ulcers, they can actually rupture the eyeball. Um, and that's because it's a weak point that can burst. So we're going to have to give him some sedation yep. and have a look at that eye properly. Defence mechanisms we brought today, garden gloves for each of us, big fat towel. Right, gowned up, ready to go. Ready to go. <laughs> so I'm going to open. Go, 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 go. That's good, that's good, that's good. <laughs> Despite his reputation, Paco barely puts up a fight. So at the moment, we're giving Paco some oxygen and we've added in a bit of isofluorine, which is an anaesthetic gas. It's just going to make him quite sleepy so that we can eventually get him sedated to have a look at that eye. Wow, that was a bit easier than we thought. He's still yeah, growling at us. He's, he's a bit better, he's growling less. Yeah. All right, so we're going to move the carrier. With Paco finally settled, the girls can now get their first close-up look at his injured eye. Ooh. Oh, wow. Oh, that conjunctiva is really red. You can just see that lower conjunctiva. So I'm just going to give the eye a very good flush. So there's quite a few things bulging out of the eye at the moment because it's so inflamed. This is the third eyelid. 
So the third eyelid is like the windscreen wipers of the eye and it helps actually clean the surface, get it lubricated with some tears. Oh, look at all that pus. There's a lot of pus back too. He's actually got a hole in his third eyelid underneath, look. Yeah. Oh my goodness, how did you do that? He's ripped the whole underside of his third eyelid. We pull back the third eyelid and we can actually see almost like a hole at the back of it, like a big deep scratch. So I think that's where the bleeding's coming from. Quite an unusual mm -hmm. injury. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that before. It's quite remarkable to think how another cat's nail... He must have just hooked it under the third eyelid and, and then pulled. Torn back. If that nail had gotten anywhere else, so if it had actually hooked into his cornea and pulled through, he could have ruptured his eyeball um, and potentially have lost that eye. So in a way, it's like he caught on the third eyelid and just damaged the underside of that. All right, we'll just turn off the light. You hold that. So we're just going to check again with some fluorescein stain and make sure there's not any more ulcers there. The actual eye itself only has that pinpoint ulcer, which should heal well as long as he doesn't rub or scratch his eye. Just come around this side, have a look under that third eyelid flap. I think there's something there. It's so swollen back here. Look at that. What is that? Oh my goodness. I'm just going to pull it out. Oh. My. This stick is massive. It turns out it's a five centimeter stick that's entered between the eyeball and his third eyelid. That is insane. It's probably one of the weirdest foreign body positions I've ever seen. Poor Paco, no wonder he was so grumpy. If we have a look behind, it's quite swollen, um, but the entry point's actually avoided his gland behind there and it's actually avoided his third eye cartilage. So I think that's gonna close up quite well. We'll have to monitor it, make sure it heals well, but I'm pretty confident it should seal over and, and, and look really good again. We'll send Packer home with some eye drops. Yeah. Um, so it's a bit more comfortable because we've been fiddling around there. So as long as he leaves it alone, he takes the drops in his eyes and Andrew manages to medicate him, he should heal really well. But three days time, we'll come back and check on that. It's definitely Paco's lucky day. As soon as he's fully awake, he can go home to his relieved owner. Okay, let's get you home. Hey, Andrew. Hi, Paco. It's been two weeks since Paco was involved in a cat fight and somehow ended up with a five centimetre stick embedded at the back of his eye. Literally, once that was removed, it was amazing how much he changed. Mm. Fingers crossed, no more fights and no more sticks. Yeah. Stay I... away from trouble, Paco. At her home in Richmond, one of Scott's longtime clients, Kathy, is becoming increasingly concerned about her three year old cat, Bella. There, Bella, let's give you some nice tickling under your chin. Bella's been acting really quite strangely um, in the last few weeks. Well, strange for her. She's been very quiet, very subdued, and of course, normally she's quite a feisty little cat. She's also been putting on weight and looking rather bloated, even though she actually hasn't been eating. OK, come on then, Bella. So today, Bella is going in to see Scott, and Kathy is going to have to separate her from her best mate, Mr Lucky. You coming too, Mr Lucky? Well, I am worried it would be real peace of mind for Scott to give her a good, um, a good check. Hello, Kathy. Yeah, hi. How Scott. are you? I'm very well, how are you? Very good, good to yeah. see you. Hello, Bella. What are you doing back in here? I promise not to lop anything else off. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Last year, Bella badly injured her tail, and Scott had no choice but to amputate. Obviously, a, a nervous moment. You want to be damn sure that you're in the right position. Bella made a full recovery, but now there's another issue. So let's just have a feel of her tummy now. If I can get you just to hold around the shoulders there for me. Oh, well. Oh. All right, well, I can definitely feel what you're talking about. She's definitely bloated. There's some solid masses present in her abdomen. Before going any further, Scott eliminates the most obvious reason for Bella's sudden weight gain. She's definitely been neutered, hasn't she? Well, the charity we got her from told us she was neutered, yes. OK, all right. A little bit of development of her mammary tissue, her breast tissue at the moment. 
Has she been doing anything else, like maybe being a bit more vocal, a bit more sociable or antisocial with uh, Mr Lucky and others around the neighbourhood? Well, we did go through a period where she was out a lot and very vocal and, I mean, really meowing very loudly. And actually, I did see then Mr Lucky try to mate her um, <laughs> several times one evening. Right. Did he get lucky? Um, or? Well, no, he didn't because he's neutered as well. So he wasn't able to do anything. So I felt a bit bad for him because I thought he was going to get a complex about it. <laughs> but anyway... Well, and at then, least he tried and tried. So he he did, couldn't quite he succeed, did, but he did he try. Did. And then she just calmed down and, you know, went back to life okay. as normal. So... Mm. Um, OK. The one major concern I've got, though, is why is her abdomen swelling? Mm. Within the abdomen, I can feel some masses. It is something that I do need to look into, I'm afraid. Well, that's why I brought her up. We need to know, don't we, Bella? Yeah. What I'm going to do is to take Bella downstairs. We're going to perform a quick ultrasound. It's hard to know exactly what the cause of Bella's physical changes are, but they are significant. Nurse Nathan will be assisting Scott with the ultrasound. Hey, what's this? Hey? All right, let's see if we can do this conscious, my love, shall we? Wow, they're really swollen, aren't they? Hmm. OK, let's have a little look, baby girl. Here we go. Liver looks OK. Look at the spleen. And then, oh, what's that there, sweetheart? It doesn't take long for Scott to identify mm. the problem. That's going to be a shock for Cathy, isn't it? <laughs> After I've managed to find the lumps using the probe of the ultrasounds, I get Nathan to have a look as well. We're both quite suspicious as to what those lumps might be. Very interesting indeed. All right, so your little lady's just through here. She's got some things to tell you, and so do I. God, that sounds a bit ominous. Yeah. Um, I'm going to let the images do the talking, OK? Can you see there's something moving? There's a spinal cord. Oh, my God. There's a rib cage. And there's the heartbeat there. <gasps> Is she pregnant? <laughs> Is she... She's pregnant, Cathy, yes. Bella. How can you be pregnant? <laughs> so unless she swallowed a couple of kittens, <laughs> yes. I think they might have got in there in the conventional fashion, <laughs> which means she definitely wasn't neutered. How many are there? Can you tell? Yeah, I, as far as I can see, there's two. But uh, also, the news is that you don't have much time to get used to it, because I think that these babies are coming very soon. I think within the next week or so, we might have a pitter-patter of little feet. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness me, Bella. Kathy is such a good sport and she's taking the news pretty well, I think. Um, it's great news that it's nothing to worry about. But I think you also need to go home to make sure that uh, Mr Lucky does have uh, his tackle missing. <laughs> because if he doesn't, you're going to have to break the news that he's going to be a dad. <laughs> Maybe Mr Lucky has got very lucky. <laughs> so now we understand um, the, the strange behaviour of a few weeks ago. It's a perfect explanation. It's just that it was one that we didn't think was possible. So it's quite a shock. But it's a good shock. Hey, look at you sucking up to the boys. That's how I got you in this problem yeah. in the first place. Hey? <laughs> Leave the boys alone. It's been two weeks since Scott discovered Kathy's cat Bella was having an unplanned pregnancy. And after a smooth delivery, the two kittens are thriving. It was quite exciting, really, because I've never seen a kitten being born. Although it's been confirmed that Mr. Lucky can't be the father, he's doing his best to be a supportive stepdad and gave Bella moral support during the entire birth. My husband got up as well and Mr. Lucky was there, so we had a, it was a family affair, really. Hello, <laughs> proud grandma, <laughs> midwife calling. Right. <laughs> Scott's now arrived to check over the kittens. Yeah, well, I really never expected we'd have this sort of I situation. know, I know. I can't wait to see the babies. <laughs> Yay. Walking into Kathy's conservatory, I'm greeted by such a beautiful picture. There's Bella being a great mum looking after these two gorgeous kittens. It's an absolute picture. Hello, gorgeous. How are you? Welcome to the world. I'm here. Bella's two kittens look 
perfectly healthy. They've got nice, chubby, furry little tummies. 215. Good boy. Good boy. <laughs> All right, OK. You don't want him weighed? Hey? Go that way. Careful. Good girl. No, and she's off. <laughs> this experience has been great, but I think it's we only want to have it once. <laughs> so. Yes. As soon as the new mum has recovered, Kathy will be taking her to see Scott to make sure there will be no more babies. This should not happen again. We'll be able to go back to Scott and complain if it does. You've done great, eh? And a perfect result to beautiful, healthy mm. kittens. Ruby here. She's brought down because I'm shaking her head. Okay. When Ruby first came down, I thought that she would have an ear infection just like all the other patients I see when they're brought down for shaking their head. It's this ear. So it doesn't look as red, doesn't look so obvious, but down, down in there is some mucky stuff that doesn't smell so good. So what we're gonna do today is first, put a little swab down the ear to get a sample of what's down there, then have a look to make sure that her eardrum is okay, and then we're gonna look under the microscope and see what we found in our swab. Here we go, have a look down there. Okay. That's the left ear, so a right L. And then the right. What I think I'm gonna find is either a mix of bacteria or yeast. And judging by the, the smell of the ear, I think it's gonna be yeast. Oh. So we've got the sample from the left ear, and it looks okay. And then we've got a sample from the right ear, and I'm fairly certain it's gonna be an ear infection. Then. We're doing an R. Before I go to look under the microscope to confirm that it's an ear infection, first I have to look down into the ear with the otoscope, which helps me to visualize inside in the ear canal at the eardrum and make sure that there's nothing going on there and the eardrum is okay. So I looked down the left ear and the left ear looked okay. I'm exploring Ruby's right ear, and the deeper I looked, the more I could make out a certain structure. Actually, it looked like legs. Ugh. There is spider down that ear. No joke. Are you making that up? No joke. It crawled out of the way. I don't know. Are you making Have a look. Up? This is something I've never seen before. I can't imagine how that would feel to have that in there. It's got black legs. Yuck. We looked down there and actually just made me feel quite nauseous. So in the canal, we go look down and we look horizontally and then there's these three little black things which I thought were cobbler's pegs and then they moved backwards. And then I went down, looked further, and it kept on moving backwards. And it's, I, I believe there's a spider or something inside the ribs here. So what we're gonna do is have a chat to the owner. We probably have to do an anesthetic and then try to pull it out. You can't flush them out because they'll just stay down the bottom and we could actually pull it out. Okay. It's all right, Ruby, we'll get rid of that. Good boy. Aww. At first I thought it was probably just like an ear infection or something, but then what I'm going to probably say is probably going to be a little bit alarming, but when I look down with the with the light and the scope, I believe there's a spider in her ear. The plan has changed dramatically. What was going to be a simple ear infection now has turned into an anaesthetic to get that thing out. 4.2 kilos. Okay, I'll give some pain relief, make you feel better. I know we're going to get it out of there. We're going to get it out of there. Hey. Brave, very brave. Some pain relief, a little sedation, makes it anesthetic easier, and then also makes it more comfortable for her. Okay. 
Okay. It's okay. Little Ruby, it's okay. We'll get that thing out of there. Nice. Short little anesthetic. You won't feel a thing. So we have Ruby under an anesthetic now. And what we're going to do is we're going to use an earpiece with a light. This is the plan. I look down the ear and have the light on. And then this is a little grabber. Down here, grab, pull out. As I was pulling it out, I was so concerned that I would pull a leg or two off and then I have to go back down there again. That there is actually what I thought was a spider and you can see how it looks like spider's legs, but it's a big bunch of um, seeds. That is so much better than having a spider down there. Now that I have it out, I can see that it clearly is not a spider, but I can also see why it looked like a spider in the first place. I'm actually quite greatly relieved that that was not a spider because that was really, really creepy to see that. So pulled out one, two, three, four, four seed pods. Um, and there's all this associated with inflammation and things. So what we're gonna have to do is now I'm gonna flush out the ear to get rid of all that gungy bacterial stuff that's been associated with those seed pods. Floaties. Very gently because I don't want to rupture the eardrum. It's looking much cleaner already. Look at the stuff that's come out of Ruby's ear. So what we have here is our spider. Now we know it's not a spider. One, two, three, four, five grass seeds. These grass seeds are little buggers because what happens is they have barbs on them which stop them from actually falling out they only go one way which means if they just get near the near the hair near the ear they'll slowly over time just work their way down 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 because they can only go one way so and five of them in there if, if we didn't get in there today and pull those out the amount of inflammation and, and how close it was to the eardrum I do believe that actually that would have actually penetrated into her eardrum and would have affected her hearing and everything else as well so good job now back to bed for Ruby to wake up what we have here is the microscope slide with the swabs from the ears we're going to have a look and see whether or not the right side has any infection there and what kind of infection because we need to give some eardrops to eliminate them yeah so not only we have seeds down the ear but we've also got a pretty nasty bacterial infection as well so we can clean that up with some eardrops so we confirmed that there is a bacterial infection down ruby's ear so we need some medications to clear that up but also it's going to get better a lot quicker now because of the fact that we removed those seeds the plan is now for ruby to go home tonight and for the owners to put eardrops in there to clear up that infection it's time to go home. Are you ready to go home? Are you ready to go home? I bet your ear feels a lot better now, hey?
Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll give it to you. Oh, sweetheart. Thank you, Daddy. I almost forgot to give Ruby's grandmother seeds, so I had to run out the back and grab them. The birds, so they yeah. go only one way, they keep them going deeper and deeper and deeper. Oh, really? If we didn't get those out, they actually would have gone through an eardrum. Oh, really? So, yeah. Oh, wow. So there you go. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. If Amy has any concerns, Ruby is well on her way to recovery, and we can all sleep better at night now knowing it wasn't a spike. Hey, good, how are you? Yeah, Alex. Chris, how are you? Nice to meet you. Come on through, mate. Chris is in Cairns helping out at the Marlin Coast Veterinary Hospital, and today his first patient is an unusual one. What is in the bag? Uh, it's a bit of a special lizard, a bit of a surprise for you. Um, they're quite an endangered species, and we're part of a breeding program for them here at uh, Cairns Tropical Zoo. Okay. Well, I heard that Chris was in town, um, so I brought in something a little bit different, a little bit rare, uh, so I think Chris will be quite excited to see it. Wow. So this little guy here is a Fijian crested iguana. Yeah. I've been to Fiji a lot of times. And these guys, I know they're in a lot of trouble, aren't they? They are, yeah. They, their population is quite low. They're only found on a couple of islands around the Fijian archipelago. Yeah. This little iguana has been named Aku after a Fijian sporting star. So what's what you're worried about him? Well, he, his appetite's gone down and he just hasn't been himself lately. So just not as energetic? Basically, yeah, not as energetic. Um, hasn't been eating as much as he normally would and yeah. Yeah, nowhere near as active as normal. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Can I just get your hole in there? I'm just going to get the stethoscope. Fijian crested iguanas are one of the rarest creatures in the world, so you have to make sure that each and every one of them is healthy and hopefully able to breed. But right now, the thing that's caused this guy to be off colour is a complete mystery. It all sounds fine. Both heart and lungs, all normal. Look, the fact that he's not eating like he should mm. makes you think that it's got something to do with his digestive system. So, yeah. you know, if we can really focus out our search around his abdomen here, the thing is, he feels a bit tense. You know, if anything, he, when I do push him there, it takes a little gulp and mm. then all of a sudden he isn't so active. So there's some discomfort coming in here. And certainly, he's what we call guarding. He is he's really trying to protect that, that belly of his. Yeah, yeah. He hasn't changed his diet at all? No. I'm at a bit of a loss to explain why he's shown the signs he is. Mm -hmm. I think probably that the best thing to do right now is take an x-ray. Okay. If we do that, we'll get a good look, I guess, you know, inside that abdomen of his and just see if anything's bubbling away there. He's a cool iguana. I've been working with him for probably the last, uh, coming up to eight years now. So, I guess, grown up with him a little bit and, um, yeah, got a bit of an attachment to him. So, it's concerning to hear there could be something wrong going on um, in his abdomen. So, hopefully we can get to the bottom of it pretty quickly. X-ray. Wow, that's not what I expected. This isn't a digestive problem at all. This is something completely different. I take one look at Aku's x-rays and straight away, the weight lifts off the shoulders. It's there in plain sight. Aku has a bladder stone and a large one. But now comes a bigger concern. How do we get it out? That would hurt. There are a couple of ways that you can get a bladder stone. Certainly it can be a metabolic thing, where you actually produce too many minerals and it starts to form a crystal, and a really big one at that. Or it can be a dietary thing, or it can be the result of infection. But the reasons why don't really matter so much right now, do they? No. So that's got to go. They are an endangered species. There's not too many of them left, so each one is, is very precious to us. All right. There we go. I've got some news that you're probably not going to expect. Mm -hmm. He's actually got a massive bladder stone. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, right. So, 
I mean, it, I've never seen one of these before in an iguana. I mean, it, it is, we're talking, you know, that large. Really? Yeah. Wow. So that would be the reason why he's been a bit off. Mm -hmm. He's carrying around probably about 30 grams of stone in his belly. Yeah, right. When I tell Alex, his face is one of slight confusion because he's not really sure whether he should be relieved or concerned. It's good news that it's not cancer, but at the same time, it's a worry, the fact that now, Aku is facing major surgery. So what's the next step, I guess? You can try and dissolve these stones, but it will take many months. I don't think that's really fair on him to put up with a stone for all that time. Yep. The best thing to do would be to operate. Actually go in there surgically and remove that stone. Okay. So that's all right with you. We can do that today for you. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think the sooner it's done, the better, really. Yeah. Isn't it? When you have bladder stones this large, you're talking about quite significant pain and usually quite significant infections as well. So for those reasons, I don't really want to delay on this. It's important we get Aku into surgery straight away. Okay, old well, man. You come with me. All right, the lights are on. Mm -hmm. So we'll try for the, the tail right here. Yep. Can you really sleep in here? I'm about to operate on one of the rarest animals in the world. An animal that is notoriously difficult under anaesthetic. An animal that is quite old and an animal that has quite a significant medical problem. Yeah, you can understand why right now I'm a bit concerned. The plan really is to cut down through the skin, through the abdominal wall, and my thinking is straight after that, I should find what I'm looking for. All right, I'm now pretty happy with this opening incision. This isn't a situation where I have to go searching for what I'm looking for because it's right there. That bladder stone is just dominating Aku's abdomen there. If there's any doubt as to whether that's it or not, that settles it. It's not called a bladder stone for nothing. It is rock hard and it is made of one big lump of crystal. It's heavy and you just know it'll hurt like hell. For all those reasons, this lump has to come out now. So believe it or not, that is the bladder, but the bladder is totally full. Full to the brim with rock. It's just all bladder stone. The challenge now is to get the stone out safely. So my hope is I can actually pull this bladder out and get it on the outside of the body. And maybe a dream. It's not really playing ball. So with any luck, if I can get these in the right place, we might just have some action here. It is egg-shaped, so I'm just trying to roll it over so I get the narrowest part. Try to squeeze it out. There we go. There it is. One big stone. Massive. <laughs> Extraordinary. Living with that, just it had to be a nightmare. It's essentially made of minerals, like calcium and phosphorus and magnesium, and they all bond together and form this rock. You can't imagine the pain and discomfort that Aku has been experiencing up until this point. If Alex hadn't picked up on those subtle signs that Aku was showing, then his life would have continued to be absolute torture. Let's give this a big flush. The worry we have is that, because that bladder has been opened, and we know that bladder is full of bacteria because it's had the big stone in it, the concern is we can now spread that bacteria into Aku's abdominal cavity. Any more? No, that's good to start with. Now Chris can start stitching up Aku's bladder. This is really, really finicky, 
everything is now shrunk down to that stone's gone, so it's absolutely microsurgery. That's the bladder now. I'm happy with how that's looking. Finally, Chris can close up the wound. This is just some antibiotics. And just provide a bit of an extra, extra barrier to any infection taking hold. Okay, my Fijian friend is done, so it's time to wake him up. Chris Tom, he's the same iguana, isn't he? Yes. <laughs> he looks very different. <laughs> Change colour, buddy. What was that all about? What he's done is, because he's been on his back and under anaesthetic and getting cold, he's decided that if he darkens himself up, makes himself black, then he absorbs more heat. It's just one of those incredible adaptations these guys have. Okay, buddy. You ready? Here we go. Oh, no, you can't leave yet. No. No, you really can't. I know, I know you think you're ready, and I appreciate that, but you're not. So let's just take it slow. You would never know that this little guy has just experienced major abdominal surgery. He is up, ready, and keen to get moving. It is unbelievable. You are fiery, aren't you? Alex is going to be here soon, so if you put on this sort of display, we'll be very impressed. But for now, just rest, huh? Hey, mate, how are you? Not too bad, how did you go? Good, yeah, it's been quite a day yep. for everyone. But he, <laughs> look, he's just taken the no frills approach to it. He's unmoved, but you can see that's where we went in. Oh, yep, yep, just in there. Three hours later, it's time for Aku to go home. He should recover pretty quickly. Mm. That area tends to heal up. Beautifully. Okay, so, awesome. After a few days, you should start to see that appetite of his returning. He yeah. should be a lot brighter than he was before. Yeah, great. He doesn't have that big rock yeah. sitting. Be a lot more comfortable for him. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay, but look, he's bounced back incredibly well after the anesthetic. Yeah, awesome. Uh, couldn't have gone any better then. Yeah. yeah. It's great to hear that the surgery went well and the bladder stone was removed successfully and who knows, maybe he might be interested in breeding now because he is an endangered species, so each and every one of them is very important. Let us know how he goes, mate. Yeah, will do. If he starts fathering some, you should know about it. Yeah, thanks so much. Okay, no worries, buddy. I'll put him back in here. It's a special day when, as a vet, you get to treat an animal that hopefully is one of the cornerstones of preserving an entire species. But today has been that day. Aku had a unique problem, but thankfully a problem we're able to fix. And hopefully now, the rest of his life involves producing many more Akus. In Atlanta, Arvid is paying a house call to check up on his longtime patient, Roxy, and her very worried owners, Allison and Clint. Well, hello, hello, Hi. how you doing? Good, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Good to see you, man. Good to see, Good to see, you. Good to see you. How's it? There she is. Look, right she's hiding. She's like, Hi. no, that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Yeah, how you doing? <laughs> 12-year-old Roxy has been suffering with a mysterious illness that's left her weak and struggling to walk. We got Roxy when she was about six months old. We had been married about a year when we adopted her. And so she's our first child. It was like love at first sight for me. There was just something about her that I had to have her. And she's literally been the perfect dog for our family. She means the world to us. Over the last years or so she's really just started to get weaker started having a lot of shaky legs and just kind of started getting increasing lethargic she just kind of lay on the couch or on the floor and not do much Roxy used to love to go on walks 
She used to like to go to the dog park and play with other doggies, but she just doesn't seem to have the strength to do any of that anymore. She likes to sing for us, which we can still get her to sing. You wanna sing, baby? See, that's the Roxy we gotta get back. After a long investigation, Arvid's just discovered the cause of Roxy's dramatic decline, a rare condition called hyperparathyroidism. That's usually caused by a tumor. Usually, you know, those are benign, okay? But that tumor is causing parathyroid hormone, excessive parathyroid hormone release in the body, which is telling the body it needs more calcium, so more calcium is being pulled from the bones. When that happens over a period of time, or long enough, it can, it can cause problems. Weakness in the muscles, bone pain, kidney failure. To reverse the process, Roxy will need surgery to remove the overactive gland. We're glad to have a diagnosis, but scared, knowing that the end treatment is surgery and that we will have to put her under anesthesia. We're scared to death. I see the nerves. Yeah. I see the nerves. So you, do you expect to, Roxy will improve in her condition and be able to have quality of life? Yes, yes. I will say, you know, with the surgery, we won't see change overnight, right. you know, cause we gotta give the body a chance to adjust. But Roxy's always been a fighter, though. Sounds good. Let's get her better. We're gonna get her better. We're gonna get her better. <laughs> is that okay with you, Roxy? Where you? There she is. Roxy has been my patient for 10 years. That's a long time. So she's almost like my pet. They become like family. Yeah, we're gonna have an easy day today. Easy day today. And their owners, we all become like family. All Thank right. you. I'll be in touch with you real soon. Yep. So it's my duty to help Roxy feel much better and to um, get her on the road to recovery. I got to do it. Hi. Hi. We're here to check Roxy Richardson for surgery. I think we're all pretty nervous. Um, she's not a young doggy, and we're a little scared to put her under anesthesia. But we know we don't really have much of a choice. Well, good morning. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Nervous. Okay. Here. Nervous. Okay. Understandable. Try to go get you some breakfast and some coffee and just relax and uh, I'm gonna take good care of her. Okay. All right? All right. So, today is here and we're here to take care of Roxy. I diagnosed her with hyperparathyroidism. We did the ultrasound and the ultrasound showed that she has a growth in the right parathyroid gland. We're here to take it out. I love you, baby. Okay. I love you. And hopefully, a lot of those clinical symptoms that she was having starts to wane and she can at least regain some of that youth back. That's the point of doing this surgery. That's the goal. Here we go, girl. Go and take a nice deep sleep, and uh, we'll see you when you wake up. As surgery gets underway, outside a dramatic storm front is bearing down on Atlanta. It looks like it's nighttime, and it's only yeah. like one. Yeah. My goodness. Oh my gosh, that's bad. That's so bad. Oh my gosh. Dr. Edward, it's bad out here. Unbelievable. Right when we're about to start her surgery, the power goes out. 
you can't make this up. Uh, do we have a light? Like a... Yeah. Of course. Of course. Uh, right now the power is still out and we are trying to get the power on so that I can get the surgery done. The generator. I guess it doesn't do the lights, huh? I'll hold my phone up. Thank goodness for lights on cell phones. You know, my staff, they jumped right in with their cell phones and pitched in. Right now, the lights on those cell phones are not only saving this surgery, but potentially saving Roxy's life. So right now I'm looking for the nodule in the parathyroid gland that's causing the problem. These surgeries are not easy surgeries to do anyway, but when you add darkness into the equation, that makes it a hundred times more difficult. Uh, you want to be able to see. This is unreal. Kira, we're going to have to monitor her heart and everything. Yeah, I'm watching it right yeah. now here. Make sure her heart rate's not dropping. As well as losing light, Arvid is operating without critical monitoring equipment. So everything is shutting down. The power's gone out, the monitor's gone out. I mean, I guess what I could do is just close her up and um, do it another day. But I've already come so far, so I'm trying to weather through this literal storm. And it's not just Arvid who's been left in the dark. Since the power cut off, Roxy's stressed owners have had no updates from the practice. I know Roxy's mom is on pins and needles. She's probably calling me a few bad words because by now she should have heard something from me and she hasn't. But I don't think I'm gonna call her and tell her that, hey, I'm doing Roxy's surgery in the dark. I got the thyroid and the parathyroid gland out. So I'm done with that. Now it's time to close her up and wake her up. That's what we call improvisation. The power never came back on, but I was able to finish the surgery. Thank God for that. Now it's just hoping that we get this calcium and everything under control so that Roxy can go into a full recovery. Come on, Roxy, let's go. Let's go, all right. Two hours later, the lights finally come back on and enormously relieved Allison and Clint are back to pick up their girl. I feel relieved that we're gonna get to see her. I'm glad that the surgery's over and it went well. Um, I feel exhausted from being stressed all day. It was an interesting day. Here we go. This way. This way. There we go. Come here. Yeah. She wants to go to the door. <laughs> she knows where the door is. Everything was going smooth. Everything was going according to plan. Got Roxy on the table to do her surgery. The storm hit. The power went out. <laughs> I saw on the Facebook page that the power was out. Uh, I was like, no. It was crazy. Um, but it all worked out. It all worked out, and uh, I think she's ready to go. I surprised myself on this one. <laughs> like I say, we don't ever know what we can do until we're put in the midst of adversity and we're forced to overcome. And uh, I'm just hoping everything goes well from this point moving forward. All right, Roxy, you're on the road to recovery, sweetie. Sash, a major bushfire is burning, only a hundred metres from the hospital. Catherine and Barry had to get through roadblocks to bring in their critically ill pet. She's been bitten by a snake, she's collapsed suddenly, she's having difficulty breathing, she might need to be ventilated. 14-month-old Dora has now slipped into a coma. 
What worries me is that she's actually not waking up and I'm concerned about her brain function. Dora is just clinging to life, but she did kill the snake before collapsing. As Catherine walked around the backyard, it was right in the middle of the yard, and it was, it was a black snake and it was dead. And huge. Just quite heartbreaking at the moment, but you know, just trying to stay a bit upbeat and think, you know, she's if she can kill that snake, she can do anything. I think. The snake venom is attacking Dora's system. So the most important part about treating a snake bite is that you need to get the anti-venom into the animal straight away because you want to try and stop the venom before it binds to the tissues and has any more disastrous effects. I don't know if Dora's going to make it. All we can do is wait for the anti-venom to start doing its job. We have to monitor her very closely and hope that she wakes up because the longer she's in this coma, the less chance she's got. She does respond to your touch. At home, Barry and Catherine's five children are waiting for news. A soft toy sent in from their youngest child is placed next to Dora to comfort her. I'd like to sit here all night with you. Get a bed next to I won't sleep. Okay. Okay, so any change you'll obviously change, ring us? Yeah. yeah. I won't be sleeping anyway. Martin, I'll see you tomorrow. Love you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. You know, you just have that big stone in your heart. It's just horrible when you are not sure what the outcome will be. Like, that's the heartbreaking thing, I think, is that at this stage, it can go either way. Outside, firemen are winning the battle against the bushfires. And as Catherine and Barry get ready to leave, there's suddenly an unexpected breakthrough for Dora. Good girl. Look at you. OK, OK. Oh, my goodness. Look at you. Dora. Dora. Oh, that's amazing. I'm going to go get them. I just can't believe this, I really can't. She's away! Oh my god. She is seriously away. Are you serious? She's looking around. <laughs> you won't believe it. <laughs> oh my god. Oh. I'm the brave girl. <laughs> Who killed the big snake? Who killed the big snake? I've got the shakes. <laughs> Such a quick recovery. I don't think I've seen one quite like this. You're being demoted to a cage. That is good news. There is no doubt that this has been a miraculous recovery, but Dora is not out of danger yet. When I go, I'm just going to have to walk away. Yeah. Walk away and we're here with her. That's OK. Is the tail working? I'm not looking. The problem with snake bites is that they cause internal bleeding and muscle breakdown, which can lead to kidney failure. So Dora needs to spend a lot more time with us in hospital before we can work out exactly what damage that snake has done to her. If we could choose between winning Lotto and having Dora back, I'd have to turn down the Lotto, sorry. <laughs> Darling girl, look at you. Oh my. It's 12 hours since Dora arrived at Sash in a coma after being bitten by a snake. You're a lucky girl. Yeah, you know how lucky you are. I don't think you realise. Despite regaining consciousness, the venom left in Dora's system is still breaking down her muscles. It's not the news owner Catherine wanted to hear. So this has really knocked her system around and she's still a very sick little thing, so... She's, yeah, she's still got a way to go, so I don't want you to get your hopes up, but she has made some really good progress. Oh, who's a good girl? She's still really, really sick. 
And so it's quite sad to see her obviously in so much pain. I'm going to kiss you, Simon. Oh, okay. A little grunt. Okay. I'm just going to pop her in the bed. Guess what? Guess what? Who's going home? Dora has won her battle against the effects of a snake bite. Oh, let's see you. Oh. And the whole family, including her canine buddy Dixon, have arrived at Sash to collect her. I have never discharged a dog to that many people at one time. It was nothing like I've ever seen before, but there was a lot of love. I don't know, it just feels so good to have him here with us again. Alright everyone, so strict instructions, Dora yep. has to rest now for two weeks. Yep. So no playing, no snake catching. No <laughs> Dixon, snake catching. you gotta keep her quiet too. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Good girl. Yeah, good girl. Okay, you get better Sorry. now. Hi, I'm Dr. Kate. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to the Bondo Vet YouTube channel. Click on the screen now to continue watching more great content. And if you love Bondi Vet, go and support us by checking out Bondi Pet Marketplace at bondipet.com. You'll find a whole range of great Aussie pet products and services. We can't wait to see you there.